So today we're having a conversation on the SIEA flap and we have a guest speaker, Dr. Jamie Zampel, and I'm going to go ahead and take a minute to introduce myself and then we'll get started with our speaker. So again, thank you everybody for joining. I'm Tracy, the founder of BRCA Strong, where we alleviate the emotional and financial burdens of women facing breast and ovarian cancer, regardless of predisposition through advocacy, direct assistance, empowerment, and events. During COVID-19, it has been challenging, but we have decided to relaunch our website. So if you have not seen it, please make sure you go to www.prakastrong.org and check out all of the amazing information that we have and partnered with so many different physicians all over the world to educate. And today we're gonna educate on the SIEA flap, which I was unaware of until I came across Dr. Zampel's page, which I found so intriguing. and. One thing that I truly do always want to focus on is knowing your options for breast reconstruction, whether it's a flat procedure, whether it's implants, or whether it's flat closure. I think it's important that all women are given this opportunity to know their options. So today we have Dr. Zampel joining us. So good morning, Dr. Zampel. How are you? Can you unmute yourself? Just give us one second, ladies, sorry. We lost Dr. Zampel, we are having some technical issues, if you can just bear with us. But again, I'm Tracy, the founder of BRCA Strong, where we wanna make sure we educate on knowing your options. Okay, so, Dr. Zampel is tuning in from California, which we are so excited to have. First, a female physician, which I think is so important to come on and share. Um, Dr. Zampel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, just so. It's okay, no problem. So good morning. Thank you again for coming on and having such dedication and wanting to make a difference. You know, I know we're going to speak a little bit about flaps this morning and then Closing it out, I'd like to just talk about some insurance issues and billing issues and denials and what women are doing. But again, thank you again for joining. And if you wanna go ahead and do a short introduction, and for those of you who are not following Dr. Zampel, please click her link off our page or go on Instagram and follow her. Thanks, Tracy. Everyone, um, Zampel, I've been um, plastic surgery. I've pretty much devoted my Hold on, you're going in and out. Let's see. Okay. Um, there you go. That's a little better. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I was just saying my practice devoted to autologous breast reconstruction. I've really developed into microsurgical breast reconstruction. Um, and then I think we were going to talk today specifically about the SIEA flap, just one of many types of flaps that we do for construction. And I can see you're going in and out. Okay. Um, I wanted it. Let's see if we can. The world of technology. Please bear with us as obviously we're having some internet issues. Let's okay. try this. How, how are you hearing me now? Better. No. Okay. Right there is better. This is better? Yeah. Okay. Let me know if I'm breaking up. Just interrupt me. Um, um, I know our goal today was to talk about SIEA flaps, um, which is, again, just one of many different types of uh, flaps for uh, breast reconstruction that we do. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about, you know, um, specific questions of that. The SIEA flap sort of evolved um, after the DIEP flap was described. Um, basically, the way I sort of think about abdominal-based free flap reconstruction is that there's many different blood vessels on the abdomen. There's vessels that all come out of the, the pelvis and, um, and supply various distributions of the lower abdominal fat and skin. 
the DIEP vessel, um, it's actually the deep inferior epigastric vessel is just one of those. And that vessel happens to come through the rectus muscle. It's um, kind of a reliable blood supply and a long, healthy vessel in most women. And so that's what we've um, adopted over time to um, have a reliable flap reconstruction, which we call the DIEP flap. And then um, surgeons, as we've uh, kind of explored the anatomy of the abdominal wall, we know that there's lots of other vessels that we can use um, also to, to supply other areas of fat and skin on the abdominal wall, the lower abdominal wall, the lateral abdominal wall, all the way around to the um, low back and upper buttock area. And so the, the um, SIEA vessel actually stands for the superior inferior um, uh, superficial inferior epigastric artery, which is uh, sort of the more superficial version of the DIEA vessel. Um, and it also comes out of the lower abdomen. Um, it supplies a more kind of low and lateral distribution of fat and skin than the DIEP flap. Um, and so that's, that's the portion of the abdomen that that flap would be targeted for. Um, what does the scar look like from the SIE flap? Is it the same as the DIEP? It's a little different. The tissue that that flap uh, supplies is more low and lateral, meaning um, the DIEP kind of the vessel typically supplies tissue right around the belly button. Um, and so sometimes those, um, the little branches of the DIEA vessel come out of the abdominal wall and supply a higher distribution of tissue. We try to um, center the DIEP flap so it gives a nice, nice low scar, and sometimes um, the vessel is centered high on the flap or on almost on the edge of the flap. And if that's the case, sometimes we can reorient the vessel that um, the flap to take a different vessel, like the SIEA, um, so that we can take lower and more lateral tissue for a woman who really prefers a low scar. You know, when would a DIEP versus an SIEA or other flap be used? And how do you choose between the various abdominal flaps when planning reconstruction? Yeah, so it's a that's an excellent question. I think we can't just use the SIEA anytime we want. It's not um, as forgiving as the DIEP. Um, originally, when the DIEP was described, the SIEA was later described, and it was described for, um, like, wound reconstruction and things like that and then it later got applied to the breast because it really is a vessel that doesn't interrupt the muscle at all it comes out entirely within the skin and fat um, there's really minimal um, innervation to, uh, um, there's minimal interruption to innervation when that flap is raised and so it it can we can raise it without like much um, morbidity the the problem with that flap is the vessel size is small and it's prone to spasm. Um, and what that means is sometimes women can get like um, fat necrosis, which is hardening of the fat in the flap or portions of the flap that don't survive because the vessel kind of the small vessels in that flap uh, spasmed. Um, and so it tended to be a less reliable flap. And for that reason, surgeons sort of went back to doing the DIEP flap as the gold standard. Um, and that's still what's done today. Um, for some women who need like additional fat on their DIEP flap, they want the volume of a bigger flap, um, we can add the SIEA vessel in addition to the DIEP. Or um, we can do kind of like more staged procedures to make the SIEA vessel a little more reliable. And so um, it so so the SIA isn't something we just kind of use as our gold standard. It would be for women who maybe don't have the DIEP or their vessels are in the wrong, their perforating vessels are in the wrong location. They're too high on the abdomen. There's a reason why we would not um, choose the DIEP and then go to our second line, which is the SIA. And then when we go to the SIA, we want to be very careful about how we plan that operation so that the vessel is the right size, the right caliber, there's a good match for vessels in the chest, um, and we really try to reduce the risk of orgasm or, um, you know, what are the advantages? Or fat necrosis. 
you know, you talked about muscle spasms. Now, I know that happens in implants, right, or flat closure. Do you see that more in an SIEA? Um, so, most, so I was referring to vasospasm, which is vessel okay. contracture. So sometimes the vessel kind of clamps down and doesn't let blood get through the vessel. And that's, that's kind of what the SIEA is prone to. Um, and, so, and so that's a little bit more what I was referring to. Muscle spasm um, typically doesn't, doesn't um, like, of the, I guess of the abdominal wall sometimes can happen after a DIEP flap because we're sort of dissecting between the muscle fibers to get the flap out. Um, with an SIA, the, the vessel, you know, we're not really dissecting through muscle. And so um, to have spasm of the abdominal wall that really doesn't wouldn't occur as much we're kind of on top of the fascia on top of the muscle wouldn't really occur with um an SIA flap although there's other you know there's other concerns and drawbacks to to dissecting in in more in the groin area which is where the SIA originates and what are the advantages versus disadvantages for an SIA yeah um Advantages for the SIA obviously are going to be um, the the ability to avoid dissecting between the rectus muscle. The, the DIEP vessels really kind of come out of the pelvis, and the perforating vessels come up through the fibers of the rectus muscle in most cases. Some women have a DIEP vessel that would come up around the side of the rectus muscle and sort of avoid all of the muscle fibers. Um, that could be determined by preoperative imaging, which I think is really important in order to plan um, how we're going to raise these flaps and where the vessels are going to come from and how we avoid abdominal um, morbidity or injury to the muscle. If there's uh, the DIEP vessel kind of coming through a lot of muscle or we think we're going to injure the nerves to the muscle or require a lot of um, intramuscular dissection, then it might be wiser to, to plan that flap a little differently. Um, the advantage to the SIEA is it really comes out of the femoral um, artery in the groin and then it doesn't go through any muscle. It does, however, run through um, superficial lymph nodes, nodes in the groin. And so when dissecting that flap out, you wanna be careful not to have like um, uh, injury to the lymphatics, um, which can cause a lymphatic leak in the in the groin area um, and fluid collections and things like that. Um, so that there are some disadvantages. The, the risks and benefits are obviously there for both flaps. Um, so so there's some, some drawbacks to the SIA in terms of the dissection, but a little different profile than for the deep flap. And how has the flap evolved to improve reliability of the vascular territory to avoid, you know, fat necrosis like we talk about? How do you, can you avoid that? What's, how does the flap evolve? Yeah, so the, the SIA flap, um, you know, it kind of fell out of favor for a while because of fat necrosis and, unreal, you know, kind of small vessel size difficulty with, um, a short pedicle, that type of thing, um, technical concerns that microsurgeons have um, about actually getting the flap up to the chest and having it survive. Um, one technique that is sort of um, a reinvention of an old plastic surgery technique is a delay procedure where if we know that, say, for example, the DIEP vessel is not intact or the perforators come out very high above the belly button and might cause like an unsightly high scar, then we might look down at the SIA vessel and see if that is also a, a dominant supply to the lower abdomen. If it's large caliber, if it's a good starting point, then um, one technique I've started to use, and, and we're just kind of starting to do some of this, is a delay procedure where we would elevate the flap um, um, almost entirely, cut the, the supply to the skin and fat from the DIEP system, and then leave a little skin bridge. And what that does is it sort of reroutes the blood supply. It sort of tricks mother nature so that the, um, the blood supply is all routed just through the SIEA to the tissue that we want. Um, and when that happens, when we do that, it kind of causes the SIEA vessel to dilate up um, to get a little bit bigger. 
um, and then to really provide a reliable supply to the tissue that we're isolating. Um, and we and I typically try to wait a couple weeks to a couple of months. It depends on the patient and the scenario. Um, and then we can have a little more reliable, more robust um, flap if, if we're using that exclusively for the breast uh, without any other vascular supply. Um, it tends to be a little more reliable um, uh, and less prone to vasospasm. I've found, and this is all kind of like preliminary data and information, um, so obviously we need to do some more studies on that. But um, there are techniques uh, such as the delay to improve the vascularity of the flap. Other techniques, you can use the flap as sort of an addition to another flap, like to increase the vascular territory of the DIEP. So say a DIEP vessel was taken along with the SIA vessel, then we can reliably take more tissue because we have two vascular supplies. Um, so there's ways to use the DIEP vessel, um, I'm sorry, the SIA vessel to, to kind of um, tailor the breast reconstruction. You know, if you do an SIA flap, do you have to go back in for a second round or can it be done the first time? Um, a second round in terms of revisions or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, typically with any breast reconstruction, I offer a second stage. Um, even with an implant reconstruction, I typically offer a second stage to shape and contour the breast. Usually um, there's a lot going on at the time of a breast reconstruction, especially if there's a mastectomy happening. Um, it's a lot of moving parts. And so, you know, I try to get almost all the way to the final result at the first stage, but there's always a little tweaking and contouring and kind of cleaning up that we can do in a second revision. Um, and so I offer that the same way with an SIA that I would with any other type of reconstruction. You know, we focus and educate a lot on like knowing your reconstruction options, but maybe you can give us like some questions that we can ask, that women can ask, and you know, direct to implant or implants are different than flaps because obviously they need to be microsurgeons, they need to, and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on like what questions women should ask these physicians that they're seeing, especially most importantly about flaps. I just, I personally feel that there's no gold standard for flaps and we've come across so many different calls where this is brought up, but you know, knowing what to ask is so important. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, um, as I see women in their breast cancer journey, I, I find that the most concerning um, thing that I see is that women just don't know their options or they aren't being told their options or they're being told their options at all different stages of the game, um, way after their diagnosis or way after a failed reconstruction. Um, and so, like, it, I think if women have the um, education and sort of the um, – knowledge going into their consult to ask about what their options are. Um, and I, I kind of think about breast reconstruction as two different categories, either implant-based or autologous, but those options can be combined. Um, and so it's kind of this whole spectrum. Um, but if women um, have kind of the pre- knowledge or the pre-education to go into their consult with their plastic surgeon and, and their breast surgeon and the oncologist to, to really ask like what their options are ahead of time. Um, in terms of reconstruction, it's so important to be at least all the options to be talked about, um, not just the implant options or not just the flap options. Even if a woman isn't deemed a candidate for a flap or an implant, they should know that those options are out there um, which women are the best candidates for either operation and, and kind of where they fall in that spectrum. And I think they should be educated on that from the time of their diagnosis. Um, even if they're gonna undergo a lumpectomy or breast conserving operation, they really should understand what that means and how um, radiation might impact the appearance of their breast long-term or the, their um, physical, um, morbidity over time. Um, and so, so I find that women who kind of get that education up front before surgery and before treatment kind of um, typically, at least even if their course isn't smooth, they feel like they've been a little better 
um, transitioned through all the steps of their treatment. You know, we talk about different procedures, right? Maybe we could just run through, I can touch base on a couple and just you can touch base on what I didn't. You know, like what's available for us is knowing your press reconstruction options is so imperative. So it's implant, right? Direct to implant, yeah. expanders. Then after yeah. that, you get your regular implants, your SIEA, your DIEP, your latissimus, your SIEA, and your pop flap. Yeah. So I, I feel like... Um... I think of it a little bit differently. Obviously, a woman who's undergoing implants can do all different sorts of things. They could um, do staging procedures to lift and shape the breast before their breast, uh, their mastectomy and reconstruction. They could go straight to implant. They could do a two-stage sort of gold standard tissue expander to implant. Um, there's a whole different, there's a whole spectrum of ways they could stage an implant reconstruction or just do it all in one stage. With the flap option, um, there's still some nuance and art to staging the, the procedures if, if a woman chooses. Um, and the flaps, I kind of, I don't think of it so much as like the DIEP flap or the SIEA flap or the latissimus or, or PAP or whatever the flap is. I kind, of, I kind of just talk to the patient, look at their body habits. Where, is, where do they have extra skin and fat? Where is there some laxity? Where is there um, a donor site that they potentially would like to improve the shape of? And then we try to kind of like tailor the flap to take tissue from that area. Um, I use preoperative imaging extensively to um, plan my flaps. And so um, if I see an area that I want to target, I'll get an MRA of that area and then look to see where are there vessels, what vessels can I use, how can I design the flap based on a vascular supply that I know really well, or do I need to get creative and do something that's a little more off the cuff? Um, and so, and so that's I kind of look at it as more of a like tailored approach when it comes to the flaps because it's all variations of the same. What vessel is supplying that extra skin and fat, and how can we kind of provide the best donor site for the patient. Um, so that, that's how I look at it. I don't, a woman doesn't need to come in and say, hey, I, I, I want a pap flap or hey, I want like a lumbar flap or something like that. They just need to say, hey, like, I really want to use my own tissue. Where do you think we can take it from? Um, that type of thing. That, um, and then the surgeon can really kind of use their discretion to, to make the best decision there. We're getting, are there any long-term problems or issues with flaps women should look out for? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's problem, any type of surgery that we offer, there can be long-term problems. Um, flaps, you know, we have to take tissue from somewhere to build the breast. And um, so it's always a kind of like push and pull or taking tissue from somewhere else to reconstruct the, the breast site, uh, we can create donor site complications. I've had them. Uh, my partners have had them. We all have them. Um, a wound breakdown can happen at any donor site. Um, you know, sometimes the contour isn't what the, what the patient wants. We try, I, you know, I, I know I try and all the surgeons I work with try very, very hard to make that donor site look aesthetic and cosmetic and as beautiful as possible. Our goal is obviously to make a donor site um, look better than it did to start with, um, but that isn't always the case. And so women need to be realistic about um, what can potentially happen at that donor site. Those are kind of like the long-term complications. The breast, obviously, you know, um, it's not a breast, it's a reconstruction. Um, and, you know, in, in no ways can we make a breast reconstruction from a flap exactly the same as a breast. It will feel different. It will um, have a different um, consistency based on where we take the fat from. Um, so there's all kinds of nuances to the long term of a flap reconstruction that, that women should know about. And as we're getting to ready to wrap it up, just a question on how we can maybe close it out is for you, what do you recommend for women? How to like, how long is recovery and truly when can you start to feel like you're 
normal self and walk again. And I know every woman's different, but like, what are expectations when you do a flap procedure? Like, what can we realistically think? Yeah. On? I mean, I try to advise women like, you know, we're doing two breast reconstructions and, and operating on some donor site. Realistically, that's going to be four to six weeks of recovery. Um, some women just kind of heal faster and get over the, the surgery faster than others. So some women are back to themselves a little earlier. Some women take longer. Um, a flap is a little more of an investment in recovery time, but that's not always necessarily the case, especially if an implant reconstruction is kind of having issues with healing and things like that or fluid collections. Um, so I, I just sort of advise my women, you know, four to six weeks for recovery for implants or flaps and plus minus based on, you know, how surgery goes and how they recover. And it, obviously if they have any medical comorbidities, it may take longer. And we really appreciate your time. And as we close out, I'd like to ask you if you could pass over three pieces of advice that you could give to women who are either BRCA positive or battling breast cancer, or just figuring out what stage of the game and where they need to go as so many women have different stages, you know, of reconstruction and then find out about flaps. You know, what would you recommend? What are three pieces of advice you could give to women? Oh gosh. Um, you know, I think, um, I think it's just important to note, like, my big thing is just to know your options and make sure you um, go on platforms like these or to get a couple of different um, opinions from surgeons. Um, make sure you feel comfortable with the surgeon that you choose. You're going to be with that person for a long time. It's not, you know, that some of the doctors involved in the breast cancer care are, are there for one or two appointments. With your plastic surgeon, you're going to be with that person for a year or two years or more um, going through various stages of breast reconstruction. So number one, know your options. Number two, like make sure you're comfortable with your plastic surgeon. If you just don't get along, like choose someone else. Um, and yeah. And number three, like have a support system, um, like having family, friends, identify who's going to be your support system during that process. Um, it's hard. It's a hard road. Women go through chemo and radiation and um, their body goes under a big change. Um, you might be on you know, endocrine therapies. So you need like a support system for that. You know, it's interesting you say a support system. Last night I'm into the show nurses and it was actually on a girl who had BRCA1 who like pushed her better half husband away like as she was getting rolled in, she's like, what do you think of this whole thing? And like, didn't think before and how would it affect them? I can't wait to see the next one because it's so important, you know, as yeah. so many different people don't want to share, push their families away because they don't know the support that they truly need. Yeah. But I did forget to ask you one question. And I think it's so important that we talk about this. And that's why I want to go back a step is, you know, how's the insurance? How does it work? How does it work with denials that you face from women who are battling insurances if you want to just touch base a little bit on that yeah i know so many women you know face denials can't get surgeons can't find a microsurgeon you know what are what are other ways to go about that or what do you suggest yeah. and what are you facing uh i mean that's the toughest question it's um it's a problem on the met the you know surgeon side it's a problem on the patient side i think you know, historically, um, once the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act was passed, insurance was mandated to cover breast reconstruction for any um, by any insurer that provided or offered um, breast surgery for breast cancer. So, you know, if they if they offer a lumpectomy or or mastectomy, then they are also mandated to provide breast reconstruction. Um, but the way, the capacity in which insurers provide breast reconstruction has kind of changed over the years. Um, and so now, uh, you know, um, I find women, typically we can get 
things cover. I've pretty much always been in network. I'm finding it harder and harder to be in network um, with insurers. Um, especially as a microsurgeon, it's it's getting a little more tough to have microsurgical breast reconstruction covered um, in a way that's reasonable for us. Um, it's getting harder for women. I started seeing women get denied for uh, the prophylactic contralateral breast in some states. Um, I you know I I think women also who have had complications of reconstruction. So it's not necessarily at the time of their mastectomy that they're getting denials, but it's after they've had a complication they're getting denials, which really is a violation of the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act. So I've seen I've seen that several times um, that the further they are out from their diagnosis, they're they're experiencing denials, um, or they're experiencing sort of um, the latest thing, which I is almost like the most troubling, which is under insurance. So they're covered for it, but they're out of pocket expenses and their deductibles and their um, their expenses are so high that it's just not even reasonable to undergo the reconstruction with their insurance. Um, on the surgeon side, I you know we're experiencing kind of like the same issues. Um, it's just harder and harder to get things approved and kind of get women through the insurance bureaucracy uh, in a timely fashion to get to their surgeries. Um, so there's headaches on all sides, and I think it really needs to be an issue that's um, confronted and addressed both for patients and physicians. Well, as a true advocate in our community, we definitely will try, and we look forward to working together and speaking in the future and having you back on BRCA Strong, you know, to talk more about these flaps and continue to educate women as I feel again knowing your breast reconstruction options is imperative so thank you so much for joining and we look forward to having you on in the future of course well thank you so much sorry for the technical difficulties this morning <laughs> it's okay we got yeah. on we got our conversation yeah. our across which is knowing your breast reconstruction options <laughs> and all about the SIEA which you know thank you again for taking the time to explain that because I, I never knew about it until I saw your page so yeah, it does wonders, right? <laughs> yeah, nice to know all the different uh, vascular supplies of the abdomen. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks well, for having me. Take care. Me. We'll speak soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.